Y'all doing okay today? Good. I know it's fall break, and so I know a lot of people are having fun, doing vacation things, all that stuff. Don't we have a good team? These guys work hard, don't they? Yeah. Does anybody know what we're talking about today? Wow. Stephen said Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> My boy is spiritual this morning. Yeah. Well, he's not wrong. We are going to talk about Jesus. But we're talking about our responsibility in belonging to Jesus, yeah? We're talking about gatekeepers, and so let's get right into stuff today. Uh, Tracy asked me this morning, well, how many more weeks are you going to be on this? And I'm like, I don't know. I haven't even gotten to Nehemiah yet. So y'all okay with this, right? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> if, I, if I have to, I can change the title so it won't bother you as bad. If you... <laughs> but this whole thing started out of the book of Ezekiel, and there's three things I want to highlight out of this book. Number one is this, you shall be ministers in my sanctuary. Now, these are things that God spoke to his people through the prophet Ezekiel. You shall be ministers in my sanctuary. The second one, you shall be gatekeepers of my house. Now, who's he talking to? God's people. And then lastly, he says this, and you shall stand before the people and minister to them. You see, guys, our role here is, if you will, our assignment is the Great Commission. We are supposed to, Paula, can I have the, the, uh, the different gates of influence? We're supposed to go into the gates of influence. As as disciples for Jesus, he is sending us into the world to go into these gift, different gates of influence, education, government, business, etc. Here's the, here's the deal. Here's what I've found out over my years as a pastor. What we have done, as we get somebody saved and get them wanting to do something for God, and we stay right here. Church and family. That's what we do, Andy. We, we just want to hang out here. And then we leave all this wide open and the, the kingdom of darkness is very quick to go in and infiltrate what God has told us to occupy. Y'all with me? When we occupy the gates of influence, when we go in with our assignment and begin to influence the, the, these areas, this is how we fulfill Jesus' prophetic words. Guys, when he said, Father, your kingdom come... Your will be done, where? On earth. Now, I understand. I know some people think, well, you know, are we going to take over the earth? At one point we will, but not now. There will always be the kingdom of darkness that's going to be present here. From the beginning, since the fall of man, that has been the case. Our job is to occupy territory. And when we go into places and we set up God's influence, we can't get frustrated and quit because they don't roll out the red carpet for us. Especially if we, the church, have allowed them to occupy the territory for some length of time. See, they should never be teaching some of the things they teach in our education system, but the, but the church removed their influence. The government makes decisions about your family. They should never be making those decisions, but the church removed its influence. And we bought the, we drank the Kool-Aid. Now, we've are, I, I can't go back into that, but I covered in detail the, this whole demonic teaching separation of church and state. You know better than that, don't you? That was never God's plan. That's man's got into the stuff and screwed it up. Yeah. And a lot of that was preachers. See, y'all should never just accept what I say. I got a couple of head nods. Some of you are like, well, I don't know, you know, I, I, should, do I say even? Yeah, don't ever just assume I'm right. Never. Y'all do know that, right? And then Jesus tells us this in Matthew 16. He says, I am building my church, and the gates of hell cannot stop it. Now, now check this out. Why would he make a radical statement like that? Because if the gates can't stop us, 
what they will do is deceive us so that we don't go into their territory. If, if they can, through familiar religious spirits, deceive us into thinking all we got to do is come in here and, and worship and mind our own business as the world crumbles around us, then he's won. The gates of hell cannot stop us. Means It means that we have to go into the gates. <laughs> Y'all with me today? That's what he said. And then he makes this statement when he said the gates of hell can't stop his church. He said, I'm building my church. And then he says that I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. Huh? Now, what does that mean? You have the authority. When you go in, I, I say this cautiously. Now, remember, guys, our battle is not with people. We've covered this in detail. Stop getting mad at people. It's one of the ugliest things when the church gets mad during political seasons because we don't agree. Now, like I've told you throughout this series, my first question is this. Why don't we agree? As the body of Christ, we should be on the same page, especially politically. But we aren't. Not only are we not on the same page politically, we get mad at each other. I can't tell you the number of people that have left my church because they say, well, that preacher, I, I've read some of the comments, or I don't, I don't read them, people tell me some of the comments that people make on social media about me because I'm too political. I'm not political enough. The problem is we've been sucked, to this, sucked into this vortex of thinking that we've got to be separate because we're holy and spiritual. Well, that's a joke, first of all. Now, we are spiritual in God's eyes, but in the world's eyes, no, no, we're not. And so we have to allow the Spirit of God to teach us, to shape us, to correct us. That's what the Word of God does, according to Timothy. The Word of God was given to us to correct us. Guys, we have this wonderful privilege of being part of this revelation of what God is doing in building His church. You and I, this glorious church that he's going to come back for someday. And each one of us, the cool thing is, God is using us. We are literally these living stones that he's placing. This is really the picture that, that uh, Haggai is prophesying about when he talks about what God's going to do when he's telling his people to go in. You think about this. One of the first lessons when we, when we got into the book of Haggai is that in the rebuilding of God's house, it started with this remnant of people. Just a small group. It was this, if you really look at it, it was the governor and the priest and this small remnant of people. What's that look like today? It's the, polit it's the politician, it's the preacher, and it's this small group of church folk. They get together and go in and change a city. And they started with the house of God. Because if you remember now, Paula, can I have my timeline? If you remember when God set this up, the children of Israel had been ran out of Israel by Nebuchadnezzar. And you remember Jeremiah, Isaiah, e Ezekiel, they had prophesied that this was going to happen. He kept telling them to repent and change their ways because Nebuchadnezzar's coming. But they didn't. And so they come in and they take over Jerusalem. They take over Israel and they destroy everything. The temple that Solomon built, you know, with all the gold that he put, I mean, he had gold everywhere. Gold throne, gold steps, just gold. They didn't want any cheap stuff. Just give me gold. Give me gold tables. Can I get a gold car? How about a gold chariot? Huh? Get gold cups? Just gold. When you look at the numbers in today's terms, it was literally multiple, multiple billions of dollars to build this thing. King David actually gave $10 billion himself. Is that crazy? One dude. Like King David had $10 billion. He was a billionaire. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Nebuchadnezzar comes in, and then he takes the best people. He goes and cherry picks. If you go read in Daniel, he says that Nebuchadnezzar comes in and says, give me the smartest, 
the best looking, the sharpest, the brightest, the most successful young people. I want them. The rest of them, you do what you want with them. And he brings this elite group of people in to begin to manipulate them under the Babylonian system. But Daniel wouldn't change. Y'all got to get this today. Daniel, one guy. One guy is, this, this is how we get to Haggai and all these dudes down here under the Persian Empire is through Daniel. Because Daniel, remember we talked about this last, last week, Daniel is praying to God about his people. <clears throat> and you remember the prophet Isaiah over a hundred years ago prophesied about Cyrus, the heathen, setting God's people free. Y'all remember last week? A couple of you, okay. Well, it really did happen. It's in the Bible. You can go read it. Isaiah 45, yeah? And, and so Daniel, sitting under Cyrus, goes to Cyrus and says, Cyrus, let me show you this letter from the prophet Isaiah. And he begins to read it a hundred, over 100 years ago, and Cyrus is in the Bible. And he's like, God's talking about me? I better do something about this. You Christian people? Y'all need to pray for me. I'm going to send you back to rebuild your land. And the, so the journey begins and we find ourselves in the book of Haggai. See, Daniel had such favor, not only with Cyrus, but he comes through Darius. And, and then he gets to this, so, right in here somewhere before he leaves the scene. You all remember under Darius, Daniel, remember the lion's den story? Daniel was in the, and now Darius loved Daniel because Daniel prayed for him. He had favor with all these heathen kings. I wonder if you could have favor with your heathen boss. Huh? What if you, what if you decided to go into some of the gates of, influ, <clears throat> excuse me, of influence like Daniel in a foreign place behind enemy lines and everything that you're not comfortable with? See, sometimes God will... God will send you into places and it won't make sense in the natural. See, sometimes, Andy, God's going to send you to a place and everything around you doesn't seem like it should happen, but that's where he's sending you. Right. See, sometimes you've got to be willing to say, okay, God, it doesn't make any sense, but okay, here we go. These people show us that when you follow them. The thing I love about when you get into Haggai is that when you follow the, that remnant of people that was willing to say yes, they begin to change the influence of what's happening. Now, I want you to understand something. This stuff that's going on here, this Persian Empire, this is all right here. These things have all taken place. This is where we are right now in the timeline of God's calendar. Now, I want you to listen to me very carefully. I, I don't want to get deep into this. <clears throat> but just to give you just a little window of, now, this is my theory. Say theory. Okay, so, because I know some of you don't believe in the rapture. Stay. <laughs> You're going to be mad when we're gone. But just, just quickly, y'all okay? Moses and Peter both say this. A day with the Lord is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. And from Adam, now th it's not all up here, but from Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years. With me? From Abraham to the cross, 2,000 years. So that's two days, that's four days. This is the six-day theory, a day with the Lord is 1,000 years. On the seventh day, God rests, and Jesus comes back for his millennial reign on the planet for the last day. Daniel's last seven years is the seven years of tribulation when the church is taken out of here. So you got the first two days, Adam to Abraham. You got the second two days, Abraham to Jesus. The last two days, Jesus, if a thousand years of a day, two thousand years from the cross to here would be how much? Does anybody know? Well, Jesus left, he was 32 when he left the planet. Are you predicting a date? Absolutely not. I'm just giving you a theory. 2032 would be the last. You're like, what, what are you saying, preacher? I'm just giving you my theory on the six-day principle from Jesus and Moses. 
I mean, if the Lord waited another minute, that's another, th you know, hundreds of years for us. We won't be here. I mean, we're, we're still going to heaven, praise the Lord. My point is this. Our time is closing in, and the pressures of heaven are manifesting on this planet. So when you look through history and you follow the people of God through the scriptures, you remember last week we highlighted the children of Israel? God had told them to go in and possess the land. But the majority wasn't on board. Just like in today's culture today, just like in today's church today, the majority doesn't buy into a lot of the stuff. Oh, I believe in Jesus, I want to go to heaven, but don't tell me how to live, preacher. Huh? You know people like that? Sitting beside you? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, God gets it. We get it. But he sent these 12 leaders to go spy out the land, and they came back, and 10 out of the 12, Billy, 10 out of the 12 said, we can't do it. And that group influenced an entire nation of people, and they followed them in the wilderness and none of them got to inherit their, the, the promised land that God said was theirs. They were, guys, they were called and anointed. I mean, they saw miraculous stuff, and God told them to go in and possess the land. He said, you're supposed to go in and destroy the Amalekites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Bud Lights. You, you, you're you're so, you're supposed to go in and possess the land. But they didn't. The majority just hung around, just waiting to see what God would do. Still the same today. See, when you go back in the lesson of Haggai and you look at what God did, he talked to the governor, to the priests, and to this small group of people. And they were willing to take a step of faith. And so they went. Because remember, King Cyrus had let them go back, but it took forever for them to get back. Now they're under Darius, and now Darius is, is Daniel's praying for him, and he's helping them. Matter of fact, King Darius, he restores all the, all the gold and not, not everything that the temple was built out of gold because it had been destroyed, remember. But all the utensils, all the things, he sent all that back with them to put back in the temple once it was built. So they get back and they start building the temple, but then they get distracted because if you follow this, if you follow this journey, you go from here and you go under King Xerxes, which this is a little window where Esther is, but from here to Artaxerxes is roughly 50-something, 60-something years, somewhere in that window, and Nehemiah shows up on the scene. Because in Haggai, Haggai is sent to remind the people because the people went back to start the temple and they got distracted by some of them same demonic influence people that was messing with Nehemiah. That same spirit is there that's here, that's here today. That same Babylonian antichrist spirit is still harassing the church today saying, you can't do that. Look over here, don't do that. And we drink the Kool-Aid. Huh? That's why we went into great detail about pastors are supposed to talk about politics. Some of our earliest churches were founded on preachers that started government. It wasn't government that allowed a church in. No church started government. And then they wrote the amendment saying, you, not, you, you don't have any say in what we do. We have the keys to the kingdom. But we bowed the knee. We yielded to the influence of the Babylonian spirits. And just like with Darius, Haggai goes in and he says, Guys, you have forgotten what the Lord said and you have drifted from your assignment. The vision that they had to rebuild the temple, they had stopped rebuilding the temple. And you know what they did? They started building their own stuff. Started building their own businesses, their, their own ministries, their own houses. And one of the big... Uh, deceptions or tactics I should say that the enemy sprung on him is this he got them thinking back to what Solomon's temple looked like like well you, you can never do that again it'll never look like that again and they're right in some sense it never did when they built the temple when they finally got it done and then all of a sudden Nehemiah shows up and he starts rebuilding the gates of the city and then you go on through history until Herod comes when Jesus comes back you know, right in this area, that temple was there until Jesus said, not a stone of this temple will remain standing. They'll all be torn down. And to this day, that temple does not exist. Except right here. 
See, I think the enemy has had too much success at keeping the church occupied with other stuff occupied with the cares of the world, occupied with comparing us with what used to be, with what was down the street, etc. And then one of his big ones is he continually tries to keep us conformed to Babylon because that same spirit that influenced Babylon and came through all these different ones, Persia, Greece, Roman Empire, it's coming back called the Antichrist in the revised Roman Empire right here during Daniel's last week. And he will try to destroy everything, but the Lord's not going to let that happen, right? This is why in Haggai, God says that you tell the people, consider your ways. Give careful thought to your ways. You see, as soon as the remnant of people heard the word of the Lord, you know what they did, y'all? They repented. As soon as they heard the word, they repented. As soon as they heard the word, they repented. I appreciate your help this morning. I guess y'all think you got it, right? Now, repent doesn't mean say I'm sorry. Uh, that's right. Repent means change your direction. Change what you see. Some of you, some of y'all need to change your direction. That is the repentance that they're looking for. And what happened when they repented, God stirred up the people. He stirred up the governor, he stirred up the preacher, and that little remnant group. That, now understand something, that little remnant group that God stirred up, y'all ready for this? They church folk. They're the people of God. You think a bunch of heathens is going to say, oh yeah, I'll go back. No, they had gotten used to living in Babylon. They had gotten used to Persia. Many of us have gotten used to this world. You are no longer of this world. You are called to be different. Not religious. And then so God has to remind the people because they had been distracted and they got focused on other things. And God tells them, he tells them this in chapter 2. He says, I am with you. This is something that you need to know today as you begin to take your steps of faith. I am with you. Oscar, God says, I am with you. When you take your steps of faith, no. Quit wondering if God's with you. Yeah, but what if everything doesn't look good? I told our... <coughs> I used this example Wednesday night in our prayer group, but it's fitting here because so often we get caught up in the middle of the storm. But the Apostle Paul, God had told him to build his church, and this is what he's been doing all over the region. And then one of the last things that, that Paul is told by the Spirit of God is this, that he will stand before Caesar in Rome. And so Paul, now listen very carefully, Paul is preaching the gospel. Paul is fulfilling his assignment. And my man is a prisoner on a ship. I know y'all think you got it rough today. He's, he's fulfilling his assignment, preaching the gospel, building the church, and he's been arrested for preaching. And they're taking him. Guess where they're taking him? To Rome. On a Royal Caribbean cruise line. <laughs> no, he's on, a, he's on a ship transporting all kinds of stuff, including prisoners. And God comes to Paul and says, tell these people, don't take this trip because there's danger. It will, it will, you know, you'll lose everything. Your cargo, you'll be destroyed. Paul tells them, and, he, and of course they know more than Paul because Paul's this preacher that's been locked up in jail. He doesn't know anything. These are, these are professional sailors. We know what we're doing. And he tells, you know, and so they leave. And then the storm shows up and begins destroying everything. And they're all freaking out. And Paul, I hadn't noticed this the other day. I, I saw it this weekend. But uh, an angel comes to Paul and says, uh, I'm just going to let you know, Paul, because you're with a bunch of dummies. He probably put his arm around him and said, all these heathens that wouldn't listen to you. He said, I, I'm going to protect you. And because of you, Paul, listen very carefully. This is the prophetic word to Paul. And the angel says, because of you, I'm going to pr protect all these knuckleheads too. Now, you're going to lose everything. The ship's going to be destroyed, but none of you are going to lose your life. And so Paul goes and tells them, the Bible says, 
Be of good heart. So Paul's happy all of a sudden. They're in a shipwreck. The storms are raging. The, the boat is crumbling around them. He says, be of good heart. The Lord appeared to me, and we're going to be saved. And then on top of that, he says, because I told you so, if you'd have just lit. How many of you are I told you so people? Bunch of lying. Not one hand. They, they, yeah, okay. Yes, you are. Paul had to tell him, boys, if you'd have just done what I said, we'd have been fine. But God had a plan, even in the midst of the storm, even what the enemy tried to destroy. God took Paul to this island, and Paul preached the gospel and got the whole island saved and healed all of them. So he had revival and healing, and then when the next ship came through, he went on his way to where? To fulfill what? His assignment. See, I know you think you got it good today, and you, well, I'm not into all that church. Don't kid yourself. I obviously will not get to it today, but I got to deal with you about your assignment. See, this is the reason that we're here. We're not here to just enjoy the blessings of the Lord till he calls us home. One of Haggai's most valuable lessons is that in order for God to reestablish the gates of influence, he has to have his house in order. Listen to me. And he's not just talking about victory. He's not just talking about, like I've told you in this series, there's over 100 churches in Scott County. To some degree, we ought to be on the same page. Right? He needs his house in order because unless the house is ordered, in order we can't go into the gates to reestablish influence. And make no mistake, there is this remnant of people that God is dealing with right now. Some of you listening, I, I know some of you, you're not going to be the remnant. You're going to be in the group. But for those of you that are willing to roll up your sleeves and say, here I am, Lord. That remnant of people he's dealing with, you're going to go into gates. You're going to exercise God's authority. This is why Jesus made this statement that I have used throughout this series out of Matthew 6.33 because it really does sum up the book of Haggai, Matthew 6, 33 is, seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all the other stuff will, will come in line for you. But what comes first? See, kingdom first stuff means that Jesus is, kingdom first stuff means Jesus is king, not advisor. You're not asking Jesus' opinion. Jesus, what do you think about this? Should I do this? Now, I know our military, is, is, is they're, they're turning it into a bunch of wokeism junk. But in the real military, they don't ask you. Derek, they're not asking you where you want to be stationed. Did they ever, Leslie, did they ever ask Evan where he wanted to be stationed? <laughs> now, you get some, some window of selection, but after that, my boy's in Alaska. Huh? I, I, I'm sure he would love to be on an island somewhere, you know. But he, he's in Alaska. I'm never, I'm, not one time has God asked me, Gary, what do you think about this? <laughs> Why y'all laughing at that? Has he ever asked you what you think about it? No, he gives us our assignment. Jesus, understand the thing, he is king. He is our example. Let's take it a step further. Jesus, if you watch his life, Jesus is the manifest will of God in a human body. He is 100% God, but he is also 100% human. And the Bible says in Philippians that he laid all his, his godliness and deity aside and operated as a human, anointed by the same Holy Spirit that you and I are anointed by. Y'all getting this? See, Jesus, he shows us how a human functions under this power. And much like in Jesus' day, I want you to see this picture today. Much like in Jesus' day, we're kind of, if you will, we're living in some similarities, in uncertain times. We see, you know, un, you know, we see things from the world's perspective, and it's not looking good. Yeah? But, but God's plan, it will, as you can see through that timeline, when he comes through those different ones, God's plan will unfold. Jeremiah said this was coming, and unless the people repented, it came. When you get to Cyrus, Cyrus is the Isaiah 45 president. God said, I'm going to anoint one that doesn't know me, a heathen, to come in and serve my people and set them free. It happened. Darius shows up on the scene, and Darius loves Daniel. 
They lied about Daniel, said that, uh, you know, that he's doing all this stuff that, you know, you got to bow, you got to worship, you got to do all these things. And Daniel's like, I'm not doing any of that. I serve the living God. So they throw him in the lion's den. And the king's all worried about it. So they go, you know the story, right? Daniel sleeps with the lions. I know that really happens, right? Throughout history, you see God's plan through a remnant of people. It does happen. All the way to the cross, from the cross till this moment here, we have an assignment, you all. You do. I know we live in a culture where, well, that's the preacher's job. That's the preacher. That's, I've actually had people tell me, that's what I give tithe for. You're supposed to do that. You obviously are clueless. My job is to feed you, to teach you, to motivate, motivate you. You know what? Even sometimes it might even make you mad a little bit. Stir a little fire in you a little bit. See, this is the thing. When you look at Jesus' day, we're living in that day. And when you follow the lessons of these guys, they're pointing us to the same thing. Guys, this, this, this is about to happen, and I need you about my business. I need you Matthew 6, 33 in it. You got me? The thing you have to understand, Jesus shows us a beautiful picture of this. In Go to Luke. Y'all okay? Yeah. All right, I know I'm, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit. Daggone it. Go to Luke chapter 13. I'm going to go with you. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Luke 13. Now, I want, I want to show you something. Now, Jesus is teaching to his, some followers, and, and he's also talking to Pharisees here. And in chapter 13, verse uh, 31, let me just highlight something real quick for you. Listen to this. On that day, now remember, Jesus is teaching. And on that day, some of the Pharisees came to him saying, Get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now you understand Herod is this demonic in, in, influence king. And verse 30, I, I love this. Verse 32, Jesus said to them, you, co you go tell that fox. You go tell that conniving, deceiving. You go tell him, watch this. I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I'm going to be resurrected. My point is this, he knew who Herod was. I want you to see his disposition when they said that he's going to kill you. He's like, oh yeah? Cody was teaching a couple weeks ago in, in our equip series, and he made this statement. He said that when Pilate was talking to Jesus, Pilate said, don't you know that I have the power to take your life? Jesus said, you ain't got no power except what my father gives you. That is still true today. You have to understand. The problem with us is we allow the circumstances around us, just like Paul's shipwreck journey. Do you understand that our, we are surrounded by a bunch, of, a bunch of clown shows running things that are on the same ship with us? And, and here's the prophetic word. You're going to be okay. They just own the ship with you. Now, God may have to destroy the ship. We don't want to hear that part of it. We just want, we just want luxury and comfort. And, huh? No, you got a Bible. Jesus said, you go tell that fox, that deceiving, conniving, you go tell him. I do what I'm wanting to do. And you can't stop it. The gates of hell can't stop it. And then in verse 32, he said, or in verse 34, he says, Jerusalem the one who kills the prophets. Wow. Huh? How often I wanted to gather you together, but you were not willing. And then he says this in verse 35. See, your house is left desolate. Does that sound familiar? Same thing that he said in Haggai. 
your house is left desolate, and I say to you that you. Now, remember, who's he talking to? Yeah, there's followers and disciples there, but there's a whole bunch of Pharisees. And he said, I am telling you that you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And even here with Jesus on the planet, we see the results of, you know, a lack of gatekeepers. That city was occupied with, and what's really sad about that time with Jesus, the gatekeepers that occupied the majority of that city, they were the religious world of that day. The Pharisees, they were the preachers of that day, that Pharisaical, that religious spirit, that Antichrist influenced spirit that you see come through all the Old Testament journeys. It hasn't changed. That's why Jesus made statements like this to the Pharisees. He said, you are of your father, the devil. Now, can you imagine that? Jesus is telling preachers that your father is Satan, the preacher. I wonder if he would say something like that today to preachers. Well, we wouldn't listen, just like they didn't. huh? See, God is always going to be faithful to his purpose. And I'm telling you, right now, he's going to have a remnant of people that's going to say yes. Now, if you go back in that story in Luke and you go back up and you read that, let me read Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, it's the same account that's in Luke chapter 13. But in verse 13, Matthew 7 out of the New Living, Jesus says this. You can enter God's kingdom only through the, what kind of gate? Yeah. Narrow gate. The highway to hell? I know it's an ACDC song, but they, they, they couldn't help it. Huh? The highway to hell is broad. And its gate is wide for the many, say many, who choose it, the majority. But the gateway to life is narrow and the road is difficult. And only a few find it. What are you saying, preacher? Well, first of all, I'm not saying anything. I just read the words of Jesus. Did you hear me? I just read the words of Jesus. He said, Wide is the gate that the majority is going to go through because they want to do what they want to do. They're going to follow the leadings of the Pharisees, their father, the devil, and they're going to be deceived and influenced by wrong spirits. That's why the Apostle Paul said, in the last days, doctrines of demons will be taught in the church because people want to hear what they want to hear. And man, I can tell you from my journey as a pastor, that is so true. If I say the slightest thing you don't like, you out. I got more people that's left this church than that's here today. And I, now listen, don't be mad at people. Some of them, God led them somewhere else. They, were, they came here and got trained. I remember years ago, my previous pastor, Pastor Gary, uh, he, he, he would retire, and then he wanted to start him another church in Frankfurt, and so he starts one, and then a bunch of my people leave and go to him. And he calls me, and he says, man, I just want to thank you for training them right. <laughs> now, listen, I took it as a compliment. I wasn't offended. We're the body of Christ. Now, does it hurt when somebody leaves? Well, sure, it hurts, but God has plans for people. And so some of those people left and went to help Gary get his work up and running strong. But he called me. He was sincere. He said, man, thank you for training them right. I'm like, yeah, that was, I'm, I'm glad I was able to train them right. Yeah? <clears throat> That's the thing that you and I have to understand. We all have assignments. Yeah? This is why one of the last things Jesus told us in the Great Commission, he says, guys, you go and you make disciples just like me. You train them to do the things I taught you to do. See, Haggai lets us know that there's going to be this remnant of people in these last days that are going to put the kingdom of heaven first. And here's the thing I want you to see, and I've, I've touched on this briefly throughout our talk. But as our redemption draws near, now you, you got to see this visually. As our redemption draws near, what happens is it puts pressure on thrones and principalities and rulers of darkness and it begins to shake things in the spirit world. You don't see all that right now, but it's happening right now. There's a shaking that is unfolding. I'm going to read it to you in Haggai that it was prophesied in just a minute. See, 
And the thing you have to understand, guys, anything not grounded in God's house will be shaken. This is why he told us that we've got to keep our eyes fixed on him. It can no longer just, guys, it can't just be about going to heaven someday. Huh? I mean, praise God we get to go to heaven. That's wonderful. But we need to be occupying here. We should be occupying until he comes as, as opposed to being preoccupied with when he comes. You with me? See, and when you go through Haggai and you get into chapter 2, God has to remind the, his people again, hey guys, you, you're, you're still here. Don't quit. Be strong. Let's get back to work. He says, I'm with you. My spirit remains among you. <clears throat> he reminds them, just like I promised the children of Israel, I'm promising you. He says, don't be afraid. And then he tells them, here's what's going to happen. And then you find yourselves in chapter 2, verse 6, and God says this through the prophet. For thus says the Lord, once more, it is a little while, and I will shake heaven and earth and the sea and dry land. Who's going to shake it? God's going to do some shaking. Now, let me, let me share this with you because as Haggai is, is speaking the word of the Lord to the people, none of the stones have been put in place yet. They, haven't, they, they got there and got their plan together. And they, get, they was getting ready to get started and then they got distracted. So they haven't really done any work. And he's telling them, even in the process of this journey, there's going to be a shaking going on. At that time, in future times, during the times of Herod, etc., but more prophetically, he's talking about, put that timeline back up, Paula. More prophetically, he's talking about this. This is the shaking that God is speaking through Haggai that's going to take place. The book of Hebrews chapter, it's either chapter 12 or 13 talks about that. He said, I'll shake everything that can be shaken. Everything in my house will not be shaken. Verse 7 and I will shake the nations, and they shall come to the desire of nations. Some of your translations say that they will bring all of their desires and all of the wealth of their nations to me. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord. And the glory of this latter house will be greater than this former house, says the Lord. What's he talking about? He's talking about his church. The prophet Joel says, rejoice in the Lord because God is giving us the former rain and the latter rain in the same month. The former rain was the seed time. The latter rain was the harvest time. And he's bringing them together at one time. The prophet Amos says it like this. Behold, the days are coming when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, those who sow the seed. It's coming to a fruition where they're all going to flow together. Do you understand when a plowman is overtaking a the reaper, there's something happening supernatural. We are living in that window of time. That is the shaking. I want you to notice at the end of Haggai, God is telling this faithful few, this remnant, because you have changed your heart before one stone was even put into the temple. Because you have changed your heart. I promise, while the seed is still in the barn, listen to me, this is in Haggai. Why the seed is still in the barn. Why the tree hasn't produced anything. From that day I am blessing you, says the Lord. You see, for us today, guys, we have to understand this prophetic window that we're in. God is literally starting the shaking of the heavens. You need to understand that as, as this happens and the powers of heaven begin to apply pressure spiritual pressure to spiritual wickedness in heavenly places remember <clears throat> our battle is not with people stop getting mad at people you are rooted and grounded in love you are supposed to walk in love with people now that doesn't, that doesn't mean you're a doormat but you have to know who you are as an ambassador you have the keys to the kingdom of heaven they were told to go in and possess the land and annihilate all the enemy in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, the enemy is, watch this, Ephesians chapter 6, for we do not fight against flesh and blood, 
but against the evil rulers, against authorities of the unseen world. We fight against the mighty powers in this dark world and evil spirits in heavenly places. Those are different ranks of spiritual force in the kingdom of darkness. All you got to do is go back and look at Daniel when Daniel was praying. The angel said, I would have been to you earlier, but there was this demon that interfered with me. This is Gabriel, the archangel. Well, fast forward to today, the kingdom of heaven has been defeated. You have the keys to the kingdom, or the kingdom of darkness has been defeated, and you have the keys to the kingdom. But if you don't exercise any authority, those same demons from Babylon that were influence, influencing these people, they still work today. Are y'all getting this? The message paraphrase says it like this about Ephesians. He said, guys, this is not some weekend war that'll be over in a couple hours. He, he says, this, this fight, this is a life or death fight to the finish against the, deep, against the devil and his angels. See, before you go into a situation, you need to take the keys of authority and you need to bind the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. When you step into that arena, then you begin to operate as an heir of the throne of heaven. You, and, the people, when, and when the people don't roll the red carpet out for you and nothing goes right and you find yourself on the ship with Paul, you're not shook. Guys, you do understand that right now there are thrones and there are governments and there are leaders that are operating just like in the days of Daniel under the powers of darkness. And so when you look back at Israel, even under the rule of that demonic antichrist spirit, God's plan continued to move forward. Huh? From Jeremiah's prophetic words to Daniel's words to Haggai's words, one of my heroes is Esther because between this and here, there's this window of time where this King Xerxes is on the scene and there is the people of God, they have moved back to Israel and they're living there, but they're corrupt and they're, they're, they're broke and they're being influenced the wrong way. And Esther, uh, no, or God knows that Haman is getting ready, the, the, the previous Hitler of his time, Haman, is getting ready to get the king to sign a deal to kill all of them. Now Esther doesn't know this at the time. She's just a little orphan girl that's minding her own business and all of a sudden the Lord begins to move in her life. Say one person. The thing that you see, the thing you see through all of these, from Daniel, from Haggai, Ezra, and all of them, God dealt with somebody. I know God's dealing with some of you. This is the thing. When you look at those people and you follow them, I'll leave you with, with these last words of Haggai. But God says this to him in chapter 2, verse 23. Haggai is speaking to the people. More specifically, he's speaking to the governor. Remember who the governor is? Zerubbabel. And he says, in that day, says the Lord, I will take you, Zerubbabel, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you. Now watch very carefully, for when you follow the life of Jesus, you go back through the lineage, Zerubbabel is the son of David. From the throne of David. And Zerubbabel gets, God says, I will make you, Zerubbabel, a signet ring. You know what a signet ring is? That's the keys to the kingdom. It, the, a signet ring represents royal authority. And he said, I'm going to make you the head of this remnant. You're going to be the king on site, the governor in this land representing me. And, and my seed is going to come through your line because you are of the tribe of David. Is that cool or what? It's, it, it's so neat to watch how God interweaves stuff through to get us to where we are today. And then he says, listen, I, I want you to get this because in, in at, at the end of it, God speaks to the prophet and he says, the glory of this latter house will be greater than the former. Now what I want to do, I, I, I want to suggest something here, okay? There is a, there is a documentary that's out. It's, it was done a few years ago. But if you're taking notes, write this down. Take, you know. But it's called Before the Wrath. And it is about a Galilean wedding. And what you need to understand about a Galilean wedding is a Galilean wedding gives you this type, this picture of the body of Christ, the bride and the groom. 
and it shows in detail how that unfolds and what takes place. You can get it, I don't know, I, on Amazon, I think. It's like $3. Make a note of it. Go watch it because he's talking about us. You have to understand, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you, turn to your neighbor and say you. <clears throat> Listen, I want, every, I want every one of you to get this today. You are this temple that God is talking about today. You are the temple of God and the Spirit of God lives inside you. You are the temple of God. And as we come together, yes. He says the glory of this latter house will be greater. The things you read about, the things you study about, the revelations that God shows you, the former reign and the latter reign. As we step in to occupy territory, God, just like he did with Daniel, just like he did with Esther, just like he did with Haggai, just like he did with Nehemiah, just like he did with Jesus, he's going to do with you. But you're going to have to be willing to be on the ship with Paul when everything around you is crumbling. You're going to have to be willing to go into some of these places like the disciples did. It wasn't comfortable. Have I got anybody that... Two of you? Okay, the rest... Well, I guess y'all just hang out till the end then. Mark my words. God's going to have a remnant. I don't have time to get into it today, but we're going to talk about it next week because in this same passage in chapter 3 where God says, don't you know that you're the temple? He goes on to say this, and I'll leave you with this thought. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is your homework. Did you get that? Okay. I know some of you, I know you think you're going to remember it. Okay. <clears throat> but in that same chapter, God says that in God's house, there is vessels of <clears throat> gold, of silver, of precious stone, of wood, of hay, and stubble. Which one are you going to be? Praise God you're in the house. We'll get into this next week because what you do here, listen, you've heard me say this hundreds of times, what you do here is determining what you will be there. You know what God's looking for? Gatekeepers. People, people willing to say, okay, what you need me to do, Lord? You need me to go to a school board meeting? You need me to be involved in city council? What you need me to do? You, you want me to do something in the media department? You want me to go influence this broke, corrupt, demonic influence media in the world? Maybe he does. Oh, no, we all need to just stay in here and be spiritual. How's that working? <laughs> Have you watched TV lately? I can't even watch a ball game without some of this. Anyway, I can't, I can't. So if you're here today and you don't belong to Jesus, I'm telling you, let me have my timeline one more time, Paula. My, my media team's on it today. We are right here. Huh? I know you may think you got time to play around with this. Tomorrow's not promised to anybody. Oh, well, you know, I've heard all this before. Yeah, they all, they all said that too. Yeah. Let's say you do hang out. Let's say the Lord does delay for, for a little bit. Well, you don't want to be left not knowing him, right? You want to go. You want to be part of God's family. So if you've never given your life to Jesus, step one, give your life to Jesus. Those of you listening or watching, stop what you're doing, man. Today's the day. It's the most important decision a human being can make. We're not asking you to be a member of Victory Life Church. Listen, if God leads you here, great. If he doesn't, we'll help you find a church. But you're here today. Tomorrow's not promised to anybody. Take a step of faith. Give Jesus a chance in your life. Say this simple prayer with us as a church family. We say it together. Those of you watching, say it with us. Church, let's help them. Lord Jesus come into my life and make me new. And from this day forward, Jesus is my Lord, heaven is my home, and I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're in the room and you said the prayer, stop by our information desk, let somebody know. Those of you listening or watching, 
Tell somebody, man, the greatest thing in your life just happened. You have a new life waiting for you to discover. Now for the rest of you all, homework is what? First Corinthians 13, or First Corinthians 3, I'm sorry. <clears throat> the other thing is this, as you leave here today, you know what I tell you all the time? God needs a Monday through Saturday, Christian. Go be that, amen. We love you guys. God bless you.